Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Red Raptor Writes. Today we're back with a non-dinosaur dinosaur documentary review. Okay, well the very beginning shows non-avian dinosaurs, so it counts. In all seriousness, I've been making loads of dinosaur content on my channel, and I'm thankful for all the people who've been enjoying it. But although I love me some dinos, there are plenty of other extinct animals that are just as fascinating without getting the same amount of attention. So, we're going to be looking at the awesome Cenozoic creatures in Walking with Beasts, the second main entry in the Trilogy of Life. Its predecessor, Walking with Dinosaurs, is the most popular of the trilogy, but honestly, the sequel is not only better written, but much more accurate overall. So good. WWB and its subjects are very underappreciated, as we'll see. Before I get started, I'd like to take time to mention that there is a lot of talk about evolution, and human evolution specifically here. My goal isn't to tell anyone what to believe, there are enough YouTube hacks doing that. I just want to discuss paleontology and new discoveries, hopefully educating viewers along the way. For those who've seen my God's Not Dead rant or VeggieTales joke video, well, you already know that I'm Christian, so try to keep that in mind. Without further interruption, let's dig this up. There is a lot to fawn over in Walking with Beasts. It does a great job at portraying many of the strange mammals from the past and the world in which they lived. I love the details about Earth's history. We aren't subjected to the super simplistic idea, first dinosaurs, then meteor, ice age, and finally man. Instead, we're shown less well-known but just as important shifts. The opening episode, New Dawn, takes place in the early Eocene, when global temperatures increase the most rapidly by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. The Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum caused a much warmer and wetter world. Through the lens of Bacillosaurus in Whale Killer, it's shown that, yes, at the end of the Eocene came a time of global cooling that led to a relatively small yet still mass extinction. The Oligocene that followed was much drier, with forests getting replaced by grasslands. Okay, okay, I can keep going, but you get the point. The BBC got every environment just right for this series, which is a step up from last time. Also, I like how WWB uses lineages. The show is usually very accurate when it comes to what becomes what. Us audiences get to trace family trees throughout the episodes to see how life is evolving. It's a fun storytelling technique, but that's not what I'm judging here. Walking with Beasts accurately states that the Ambulacetus in New Dawn will evolve into whales in episode 2. Paraceratherium, although not closely related to modern rhinos, shares a super family with them, Rhinoceratoidea, so rhinos are their closest relatives we have today. The puny Eurohippus and bizarre Calicotheres are correctly linked to horses. And of course, we see the beginnings of primates to their development into humans. Two exceptions here are the Andrusarchus and Entelodon, the former with goats being used as their closest modern relatives and pigs for the latter. Although these are all even-toed ungulates, both the Andrusarchus and Entelodon have been repositioned closer to hippos, but that's not due to negligence, just our understanding of prehistoric life changing. This documentary aired 20 years ago, but most of their creature designs still hold up really well. That's more than what can be said about several other documentaries. Maybe this is due to focusing on mammals, so we have modern analogs to give us insight into how the extinct looked and behaved. And sometimes, we just have more information due to how recently certain animals died. And when they do, nothing gets in their way. So you have chosen death. Whatever the reason, Tim Haynes and crew certainly outdid themselves. One mammal I really like is the Leptictidium. Some of you may remember this guy from that one episode of Jimmy Neutron. Hey -yo, ah -ha! Hey, 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 hey -yo. No, they couldn't sing and dance, but their portrayal is spot on. Despite not being related, Leptictidium is often compared to the elephant shrew, being able to walk on all fours but jump on its hind limbs. The cranial anatomy is similar too, causing paleontologists to recreate Lepi with a proboscis. Now, there has been debate over whether they were runners or jumpers. The feet look like those of jumpers, but the legs may not have been able to handle the shock of jumping. Walking with beasts obviously goes with the jumping side, which seems like a reasonable position to take. A cool fact about them is how their stomach contents have been found too, which show that, like in the series, 
They ate smaller animals like insects, lizards, and other mammals. I also appreciate the Bacillosaurus, having its oddly long and slender appearance, looking more like a giant sea snake than a whale. And while I'm on the subject, it's cool how the creators show it hunting its relative Dorodon. The two lived at the same time, and a juvenile Dorodon fossil showed bite marks which probably belonged to its much larger cousin. In the same episode, it's worth mentioning the Bronthotheres aka the Embelotherium. The show succeeded in showing off their strange crests as mainly for display, being too delicate for combat. Plus, even the adolescents have them, which is factual, since these ornaments were present on all skulls found, young and old. So, Ambelotherium probably wasn't very sexually dimorphic. Overall, a really nice detail. As for the woolly mammoths, we've been finding them frozen in ice for centuries. If the BBC couldn't make convincing mammoths, then it's instant game over. Thankfully, this doesn't happen, and like many other animals, they look great. In the last episode, we get a glimpse of the Eurasian cave lion, and whether it was on purpose or happy accident, they were done well, much better than that of another documentary that shall not be named. It's great that they're not live acted by modern lions, or just CGI copies of them. Nah, they have the panthera build, but with key differences, being more lightly colored and having a thicker coat. They're also not shown with any manes. Maybe we're only supposed to be looking at females, but manes are unique to modern, true lions. We know this because no cave paintings of Eurasian or American lions show them. Moving on to their behaviors, we already got to see the varied diet of Lepi and whale-eating Bacillosaurus, but there's a lot more here to praise. Unnamed Entelodonts, we'll just call Entelodon, make their appearance in the best Walking With episode, period, Land of Giants. In it, we see two males fight in order to establish dominance. I mean, T-posing and getting that Number one, victory reward are good enough for me. But there is truth to this. Skulls from the other Entelodont, Deodon, show bite marks all around that only other Deodons could have made. So the idea has been proposed that these animals got very aggressive with each other. Now we get to discuss one of the most famous prehistoric beasts, the Smilodon, or better known as the Sabertooth Cat. Starting off, it's good that the documentary specifically chose to refer to them as cats instead of tigers because they were not tigers at all or close relatives. Tigers belong to a specific species of feline called Panthera tigris. These dreaded saber toots come from a completely different lineage of cat. What we see in WWB is the South American species Smilodon populator, which is the largest of the Smilodons. Their portrayal here is actually excellent. They're shown to be ambush hunters, which makes a lot of sense. Smilodons were very heavily built, meaning they weren't suited for long distance chases like cheetahs or lions. Speaking of lions, the entire lion lifestyle is copied here. The saber toots live in prides, females do most of the hunting, and the males battle for control over the pride. Oh, and the cubs from the previous male will be killed off if a challenger wins. What are we going to do? African lions are in the same genus as tigers, panthera, so they're not close relatives of half tooth. Therefore, they don't make good analogs for these cats. However, fossil evidence does seem to point to a pack or pride structure, although this idea is not without pushback. Some arguments for a pack lifestyle are serious injuries given time to heal, suggesting individuals being cared for by their pride, sexual dimorphism between males and females, wounds seemingly caused by other saber tooths who could have been fighting for dominance, and one find from this year is of a Smilodon family that was buried together. None of these alone necessarily proved that these cats lived as they did in the show, but together are a good indicator that, yeah, they could very well have lived in prides. Since this is what the series is arguing, then I love the added detail of short manes on the males. Not only is it a nod to lions, but would have protected the males from all the intraspecific battles they engaged in. To be fair though, it has been argued that perhaps Smilodons weren't smart enough for pack hunting since their brains were smaller than those of modern big cats. And being an ambush hunter in the South American forests and grasslands, they might not have needed to work together. I personally would throw my hat in with the pride social structure idea, but I wouldn't bet my dogecoin on it. Either way, this portrayal did the legendary Sabretooth justice. One final compliment I want to give is the inclusion of ants in New Dawn, 
When I first saw this, I thought, no way. There's not a shrekking chance that the largest ants lived in Germany at the exact same time this episode takes place. You know how these documentaries can be. Something cool exists and is crammed into the wrong time and place just to show it off. Well, not here because the largest ants, Titanomerma, did live in Germany 49 million years ago. The exact time and place of the episode. Dang. Dang the writers did their research. I shine my shoes, press my pants, did my homework. I do my homework now. With all the praise that this documentary is due, comes a few criticisms. Once again, Walking with Beasts is 20 years old, so it makes sense that our understanding of prehistoric life has progressed. Thankfully, we keep learning new things. Perhaps the most dated aspect of the series is its portrayal of Gastornis. The size and overall anatomy is fine, but we're given a picture of an early terror bird-like predator that chases the small mammals of Eocene Europe. For decades, this idea has been disputed, with some paleontologists pointing out the very flat beak with no hook at the end. Instead, it has been suggested that Gastornis was an herbivore that used its powerful beak to crush nuts and seeds. In 2012, footprints of the large bird showed no traces of talons that you'd expect to find if it were a predator. The final nail in the portrayal of the forest racket wannabe came in 2013 when the calcium isotopes of its bones were studied. The study showed that its diet was far more similar to herbivorous dinosaurs and mammals rather than carnivorous ones. In other news, a few species featured have been reclassified. Aside from the Androsarchus and Antelodon we already covered, the name Indricotherium has come into question. Yeah, the narrator only refers to it as an Indricotherium, which is still technically accurate, but just to be clear, the genus itself has been synonymized with Paraceratherium. The little pony dudes pro paleotherium also find themselves lumped into Eurohippus. And the term Cro Magnon has since fallen out of use because there really aren't enough differences to separate them from modern humans. Instead, terms like early modern human or anatomically modern human would be more appropriate. Macrachenia too has gotten a revision. WWB already has it too nimble and deer like when it would have been more heavily built like a camel. However, even its most notable feature, its trunk, may not have been present. This South American herbivore has often been reconstructed with the trunk due to comparisons between its skull and that of tapirs. They both have large holes in between the eyes where a long snoot could have been anchored. But more recent studies argue that Macrachenia skulls were more like those of moose. Mooses? Meese? So simply having large face holes does not automatically call for a trunk. To be fair though, a cave painting of a trunked ungulate has been found in South America. This may be a close relative. Who knows? Perhaps they were Squidward-like. Oh, cheer up, Squid. It could be worse. Yeah, you could be bald and have a big nose. Another thing I want to talk about is one cool cat, Dinophilus. This was a very heavily built cat that hunted on the plains of Africa from about 5 to 1 million years ago. It would have certainly shared an ecosystem with the Australopithecus we see in the documentary, and has had an infamous reputation as a hominid hunter. However, more recent chemical analyses point to Dinophilus feasting on more grazing animals, while other predators like leopards, hyenas, and a megantarian enjoyed hominid meat more. I can't say this cat never enjoyed humanoid flesh, but they weren't included in their balanced breakfasts. And lastly, I just want to make note that Paraceratherium is no longer considered to be the largest mammal anymore. I don't think the documentary specifically claims that it is, but it basically pushes this idea. Nowadays, Paleoloxodon is considered to be the largest mammal ever. Now it's time for the inaccuracies that they should have known to avoid. Thankfully, there aren't too many. Despite being awesome and interesting predators, I haven't mentioned the terror birds much at all yet. The name terror bird refers to members of the family Forest Vacidae, which is comprised of huge, flightless killer birds. They appear in the fifth episode Sabretooth, represented by the type species Forest Vacus. The problem here is that while terror birds did live in the Americas at the time of the episode, one million years ago, Forest Vacus itself did not. Instead, it lived during the Miocene, going extinct 13 million years ago. I would argue that the writers got the genus confused with Titanus, 
but they're only known from the US and are specifically referenced. While these terror birds eat Smilodon's leftovers, their cousins are running riot in Texas and Florida. It's also worth mentioning that some of the mammals are shrink-wrapped or in general made to look scarier for the camera. Considering that their closest living relatives are the hippos, it's weird to see the Intellidons look so bony. Even comparing them to pigs like the episode does comes up lacking. The same can be said about the Hyenodon. It's given these large saber teeth and little fluff or flesh. It's also super oversized, said to be about the size of a rhino, when even the largest species, Hyenodon gigas, was more in line with maybe a bear at best. Also, hyena facts are lifted for this animal, despite not actually being related. Their order, Hyenodonta, is completely distinct from Carnivora, where the vast majority of today's predatory mammals are found, like hyenas. Any similarities are due to convergent evolution. The bite force is taken from the spotted hyena of over 1,000 pounds per square inch. I can't find any concrete estimates for Hyenodon's bite force, maybe it's more, maybe it's less. And it's said to have eaten every bit of the carcass, just like real hyenas. Could future studies prove these claims to be true? Sure. I'm just saying that despite their names, hyenas don't make for solid references for hyenodons. It is also worth mentioning that some animals make appearances out of their time or out of their place, although not being as dramatic as some of the dinosaurs in the previous series. The Ambulocetus appears in Eocene Germany, despite only being found in Pakistan. The single Androsarchus skull is found from about 41 million years ago instead of 36, during Whale Killer. Antelodon and Cynodictus show up later than they should, both going extinct a few million years earlier than when the episode takes place 25 million years ago. And I already mentioned Forest Vacus, which is the worst offender of time jumping. Even as a longtime fan of dinosaurs, I gotta admit that Walking with Beasts is one of the best documentaries out there. It tells engaging stories while arming audiences with buttloads of new knowledge. There are so many fascinating yet obscure animals on display here that unfortunately never see the spotlight. Thankfully, they're done justice here, with overall great designs, lifelike behaviors, and realistic environments. For all that, I'm handing Walking with Beasts an A-. In perhaps one of history's greatest upsets, it blows its predecessor to smithereens and solidifies itself as one of the most accurate documentaries to date. If you haven't done yourself the favor yet, watch WWB. So everyone, was I fair to this follow-up? What compliments or complaints did I skip over? Please let us know in the comments below. And remember, if you enjoyed this episode, to please leave a like and subscribe. See you next time.